you. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for the invitation to this beautiful campus. And uh, I think uh, a piece of public lecture it should be a nice piece of a green tea chocolate for this Valentine's Day. And uh, I, I didn't catch the words you introduced me, but I have to say I'm a deputy managing director for the IMF, not a managing director. Otherwise, I probably will not be able to come back to my office. My boss, which, uh, which is uh, Chris Lagarde, will be very unhappy. <laughs> um, you are the new generation. And you're facing a new war. So I would like to show you something really new. It seems to me the world has been changing in the past 15, 20 years, and our understanding for the war, particularly economic war today, is completely completely different from say 10 years ago. So I will call this talk, I will call it a new and a challenger war. It's a new and it's challenging. So I'm going to go through the four things, one thing is the cluster structure of the global economic system, and because the cluster structures were living in the hyperconnectivities, and the spillover becomes such a big issue for us in the economic affair world. And then I come to today's economic situation I call the new normal, and then come to the policy agenda. How do we deal with this new situation as well? The first issue is the cluster structures. This is the world we see every day. It's difficult for me to see that. Let me move to here. This is the map we see every day, right? It's nothing wrong, nothing new, and countries positioning itself nicely, and I'm sure you can find the words UK. Now, I try to see if I reposition a country and the graph check it by its GDP, so I call it an economic map. How this map will change? Oh, the machine was not happy. <laughs> he should, should give me music. If you're looking for, this is a Russian, okay? You see what happened? Russian become very small. Uh-oh. This is the country defined by GDP. The map about economic power. You see, US is very big, China also second is big, and the UK is here is quite a bit as well. Now I want to see further, if I define the countries not only by GDP, but by trade, because in today trade is such a big issue, how the map will change. And the map indeed change again. Look at the map. You see, the Europe will become very big because intra-European countries trade account more than 60%. So it's become big trade areas. So trade is a big issue for the whole region, which is good and which is bad, but then we'll come, come to that la uh, later. But you do change the map. Now the most interesting is today because financial sector is such an important issue. So capital flows moving in, move out across board. So if I measure country by financial flow across board, let me say I get across board, not the financial assets sitting in the countries, how the map will change. Look about China. This is China. See? China become very, very small. Wow. Anyone want to guess what is this country? 100 pounds. Exactly, Luxembourg. You must be a professor. <laughs> Since you're a professor, I'm not gi giving to you 100 pounds. <laughs> now the second issue is, this time maybe 200 pounds. What is this? I heard of Singapore, which is wrong. Yes, it's a Hong Kong. You will see how small is China in terms of financial flow across the board, how big is Hong Kong. What does that tell us? The geographic area today 
don't mean very much for economic and financial strength for country, for states, for nation in the world today. This is the real economic world because this map captured economic activities <coughs> of the whole world today. More than that, this is go back to the map again. This is the country here. What we found in the past 15 years, because of globalization, country really groups them together and into different clusters. The most interesting is when the those move together. They have very close relationships. The first we found the world divides a few clusters. The first big clusters we call the advanced economy, which is very much a service to the financial sectors. And the second cluster is Asia, I call the vertical supply chain clusters. But more interesting, you may not realize, for example, Brazil, for example, Chile, all those countries today belong to Asia, belong to Asia supply chain because they provide commodities, resource, and, and the manufacturing inputs. And all the, the Latin America, South Latin America area countries below the Panama Canal move to Asia economically. And the third group is energy group. So in very different place, Kuwait, Kazakhstan, you know, Saudis, whatever the place they are, but they do share one common nature, they have the resource, they share the same economic cycle, economic beh behavior, in more share the same economic policy as well. Now, the world is not organized this way before. This is very different from the concept we, ha we had before. We say it's a three world, the first world, the second, the third world. It's not. It's the world defines three clusters by economic interconnectivities. Now, let me show you something. This is the map. This is the Europe. And the Europe, before Europe, they have a very interesting economic structures. There are two centers in the Europe, economically. The, the southern center have a core, which is France and Italy. Who is the core of the northern center? Five hundred pounds. What country is the core of the northern center? Between the eighty-four to ninety-nine. You guys too humble. Yes, please. No, it's too north. <laughs> it's the UK. UK was the core of the northern center. But really what happens, this is 84.99. After the euro, this is 99 to 2011. All the European countries today group together and they become one economic unit. Who is the core? Germany. Europe completely, completely changed the European economic financial structure. More than that. What we found is more interesting today, the world is linked to each other, country linked to each other, not by linear relationships to those, like everybody go to New York, is not the case. What we found, the global economics is organized or textured by what I call the cluster structure. For example, this is a small cluster, a small group. They have a gatekeeper. This gatekeeper will bring this small cluster, small country of group to the middle or, or, or group, and it's a middle group will bring to the core. So then it's a group to group to the core. That's the way the economic and the financial sector link to each other today. Because it's a cluster structure, the interactions, the interconnectivities increase dramatically. Here's the real case. 
For example, this is the seven clusters in the, in, in the European area. You will see, for example, this is Greece, this is Bulgaria, this is Romania, this is the whole thing. The gatekeepers, Austria and Italy. And there's a Hungary, the Czech, it's a Slovakia and the Poland. The core also is Italy and Austria. You will say, why Austria? Never thought about that. Why Austria can be a gatekeeper for a small group of countries in Europe? Back to history. Because Austro-Hungary Emperor, 150 years ago. You know, it's very interesting, the business relationship is really go deep roots back to the history and move into the future and, 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 and exist today. So the country, if you have economic activities or issues, for example, if you issue the bonds, something's happening in New York, it's not everybody go to New York to buy the bonds. It's rather go through the clusters, the gatekeeper brings them to the wall and go through further. And let me give the European case. So is this the, the, the European case? Is this a real case? For example, is this, is this a, a Latvia? In Latvia, for example, in the Latvia financial connections, it will go through Finland and Sweden, it not go to the UK directly. And the Finland will go to Germany, and the German will go to the UK, because the UK obviously is the global financial center. Yeah, you say, I have an email, right? I can send email to whatever the people in the UK easily say, I want to buy whatever the shares, whatever the stock, whatever the assets. No, in the real life, it doesn't work that way. So there's a texture behind the economic activity that we fool, but it is a much richer, much complicated economic textures, far beyond what we understood before. So this is a, the global trade clusters. This is Asia and Europe. You will see China play close, China, Japan, actually China is close to the core, and bring all the region to the world, they're the core, and this UK, France, and, and the Netherlands, Germany, bring all the European countries to the core. The trade happened very much in the network of the core. Most interesting is you see US is here, U United States is here. See why US is here? US has nothing to do geographically for the trade between Europe and Asia. Why is the U US? Because U.S. is a such an important global economy. They provide all the financial trade financings, provide all the logistics su supplies. So even the trade between the Europe and Asia, U.S. is a core. Once again, the whole concept go far, far beyond what we thought defined by geographic area. This is a real economic map. This is a machinery class that I moved over. So because it's a new cluster structures, the world is so linked to each other, much, much more than we thought. We live in really a hyper-connectivity, connected world as well. Because Tom said, let me go through. Let me show you one thing. This is a co-movement of the global financial market. The three market is, the equity market, the currency market, and the bonds market. You will see the co-movement for those markets is very high, roughly from 40, 50% to 70, 80%, roughly in 10 years horizons. But also the co-movement between and among those three markets increased dramatically, particularly in the financial crisis. You see, the global currency market co-movement increased dramatically. Global currency market and equity market move closer to, to each other, which is absolutely amazing. If you are a financial major, you know equity market and currency market never move together. While the currency market doesn't move because dollar becomes the safe haven. So the, 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 the capital flow move into other directions, move, move into the US market. If the whole market moves together, with a coefficient of a 60 to 70 percent. 
How do you do portfolio management? What's the difference you invest in UK, in Lima, in Hong Kong, or in Cairo? It's also very interesting to see, this is the, the co-movements in the equity market. You will see, this is the five different equity market we call it from US, Japan, US. Let's see when from the Latin American to emerging Asia, there's a bloom light. So the equity market co-movements between the Latin American market and the emerging Asia, you see roughly 10 years ago, it's roughly 42%, and today it's 81%. Can you imagine? It's two markets thousands of miles away, but market move almost in the same directions, in the same speed, with the co-efficiency, 82%. Why is that? As I said, because when the Latin American uh, uh, economy in the real economy moved the financial market follows. Regardless the culture, regardless of pe people's behavior, you will say in Asia people walking extremely hard, in Latin American people like dancing, drinking, you know, enjoy life, but the market moves in the same way. And more than that, it's not only capital market move together, it is the real economy move together as well. So we, we, we see in the different periods, this is a GDP co-movements, it's a GDP growth rate correlations. You see so for all the countries in the world during the financial crisis, you see that the GDP co-movements coefficient is roughly 55%. Regardless where you are, regardless whatever your size, uh, your, your, your nature of it, your economics, you move with all your neighbors, whatever the country together, roughly the 55%. And before it was relatively small, and after, this is uh, 10, 12, it drops. Why is that? Because the hurting behave. The hurting behave not only happen in financial markets, it's happen in the real economy. This is animal spirit. It is animal spirit that drives economic activities, and it not only drives the financial market as well. So it move the world, move together, which is a huge challenge for all the policymakers, for everyone. And this is in emerging market. It's a synchronized emerging market slowdown. You will see in the past few years, emerging market growth is slowdown. down. Everybody talk about that. But the real things, what we see, this is a percent. So it's more than 90% emerging markets slow down together. That means if you see something change, it's not one particular isolated event. It's the whole group. It's the whole cluster countries move together, which is also very much new. And then speed over becomes the big issue. With this speed over, we try to understand how this big and major economy have a spill over, have an impact for uh, the other countries. We did five big groups, which is uh, Euro, Euro area, US, China, Japan, and UK. UK is also here. What we found is the blue bar is the financial impact, and the red is uh, the, the real economy, it's a macro shock. You, we found the financial shock is much bigger than the macro shock, the real shock. But obviously, the United States and the US still the major one. And uh, this is the macro shock, the real shock, it's relatively uh, much smaller now today. Um, in Econ 101, you always study macro shock, right? It's a real shock. But today, from the spillover over point of view, it really is the financial sectors. So we try to see what spill over from the United States. We try to decompose. So we decompose the US. If the US drop 1% of the GDP, what will be the impact for all the other countries? Or if the US have a financial sector shops and uh, uh, the, 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 the risk uh, uh, index change <coughs> on what will be the, the impact for the whole world, we decompose them into the different. And the blue one is the real shock, macro shock. The red bar is a financial shock. You see, the financial shock is much, much stronger and bigger than the real economic shock. And you see, it's very interesting. 
Obviously, the U.S. has the largest uh, external spillover impact on the Canada, you understand that. And also Mexico, you understand. But the third one is Saudi. And fourth one is China. It's absolutely amazing. Until I see the picture, I cannot believe it. China is the fourth country received the spillover factors from the United States. So spillover is really become a big issue. Now, because the emerging market becomes such a big country now, so we are today not only spill over, but we call we have a spill back. That means if advanced economy have a 1% of GDP drops, it will have a negative impacts on the emerging market roughly from 42%, which is pretty high. And, but also, if this emerging market have a 1% of GDP growth drop, we'll have a 22% of those smaller, but still 22% negative impact on advanced economy growth as well. We all, we all truly live in an interconnected world. Everyone's activities and behaves impact all other countries in the world as well. This is a big and a fundamental change. It's a big and a fundamental challenge for everyone. Now, then come to the new normal I call today's the global economic uh, situations. What we see today is a very interesting and new, but also very challenging situation as well. So, this is a 2008 financial crisis. You, you see the GDP drops, but GDP never go back. In all the crises we observed before this crisis, the GDP were drops when go back and gradually go back to normal trend. So historically, the trends always move, move that way. This is the time we dropped, we never get back, we always run below the potential trends. Today, the whole world lost a one and a half percentage of its potential GDP of the whole world in the past seven years. And look quite like we are permanently losing this gap. I don't see any chance this curve will be able to go back. Now, this is very new because we experienced so many crises before, but this is the first time we see we drop or we'll never go back. Why is that? And the growth is, is weak. And what we found is very interesting. If we decompose the world demand, you will see the first issue is the global investment to GDP ratio today, 2013, compared to 2007, is, a, is a lower, even with the strong investments in the emerging market. And you will see the consumption is a little high, a really drive the growth is government expansion, which is normal in, in almost all the crises we experienced before, but this time, in seven years, the share of government increased two percentage of a global GDP, which is really big, more than that. You will see the trade. In all the time, the trade growth rate is roughly two times of GDP growth rates. This is the first time, 2008 to 13, the trade growth rates is lower than global GDP growth rates. It never, ever happened before. More than that. What well, the most interesting is FDR flows. The FDR flow actually from 2000 peaks and gradually dropped down today compared with 2007. The FDR in terms of share of global GDP roughly from 2.4.2 uh, to 2.8. The whole world lost roughly 1.4 to 1.5 percent of global GDP of FDI. Why is that? 
we lost the FDI, we lost the trade, and then we lost the investments. So those are the real cause behind to make the growth so weak. And because the growth is weak and inflation expectation is, is a very low, so we are facing and deflationary pressures. So if you're looking for the five year, five years for the inflation swap, you, you see the rate is always on downsides and the continue on downsides in the past few weeks as well, which have become the one of the big potential risks for the whole world as well. More than that. When we say government expenditure become the main drive force in the past few years to support the global growth because the share of uh, G increased two percentage points. That means the growth in the government expenditure is much, much stronger than GDP growth. So government's share in GDP increase, right? It's very simple. But the government debt also increased. In the advanced economy, you will see the government debt increased roughly from 73% to 106. And we expect to see them gradually, gradually slow down to 100% to 2020 still 100%, which is way, way high. Even in the, advan in the emerging market, we'll see the adjust on the government deficits is slower. This is 20, 2012, we expect to the deficits drop on that way, but the, the real curve, the deficit remain, and did not drop at all, drop should go up. So both in the emerging market and, and advanced economy, the fiscal situation is a deteriorating. What does that mean for growth, for that? What we see is, if you want to lower the debts, the three things are very important. You need the, the debt growth to be slower, you need inflation, you need a strong growth. Those are three things will be able to bring the government debt down, right? The inf inflation rate make the debt not real, and the growth drop the debt because the denominator become bigger, and you have a slow debt increase. So you will see, this is the, the case in the Asia financial crisis. The debt growth is not very strong, and the, the growth is very strong, so it will be able to reduce. And this is in the hyperinflation cases, you will see, because inflation is really high, even debt increase is very strong, but you will still be able to drop the debts because inflation balance to each other. What happened this time? You will see in this time, the inflation rate is much lower than average of all the crosses we had before, and we see the government expenditure is higher than average we had all the crosses before, and we have the government growth, or we have the GDP growth, is much weaker than average of the before. No wonder we still run the government deficit. When you get into the 100% government deficits, it will be extremely difficult to drop the deficit down. We did historical studies, which is roughly 140 years for 77 cases. We found if a country have the deficits drop up to 100, it's very difficult to bring them down, only if you have the crisis. There's a few cases where we'll be able to drop the deficit down. Once in the, in the US after the Second World War, once in Canada 1995, the First World War in the UK, and uh, I think it's in the Belgium, uh, another case. Otherwise, you always get yourself into a crisis. It's very difficult. Now, the real challenge is here. When the, the government debt increase, right, you will see here, in all the advanced economies, in 2007, the debt ratio is 72.7. Today, it's 106.5, roughly increased 42%. How much do they pay for that debt? You see, in 2007, they paid 2.9% of their GDP as interest payments. The debt increase 42%, how much do they pay today? Still 2.9%. Why is that? The interest rate is so low. It's almost a zero. 
So your debt's piled up, but interest payments still low. But the question is, what if tomorrow interest rates increase? Everybody understand the Fed is going to raise interest rates. <coughs> and if interest rates increase, the interest payments increase, they will further cut the government expenditure. So it's become ever clear on the fiscal side, there's a no space to further stimulate growth. And on the monetary policy side, you will see the central bank's balance is really increase dramatically. This is, uh, the, 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 this is the Japan, and this is the US. You will see really central banks increase. It's not only this is China, and this is Russia. All the countries' central banks' balances expanded during the crisis wells, and uh, interest rates drops almost to zero. Everybody see that. And even in the emerging market, interest rates much, much lower compared with pre-crisis periods. And, uh, and everybody expect to see further raise interest rates. And we, we observe, on, but uh, when expectation of interest rates on the upside, the, the 10 years yield in the bonds market is still on downsides as well. And we see because uh, the US have a strong growth, and the dollar become very strong, and the euro and yen become very weak. This also says we don't have very much monetary policy space as well. I think that that's the main challenge we're facing today. The growth is weak because investments is weak, trade is, is weak, FDI is weak, but we don't have a macro policy. We don't have a fiscal space, we don't have a monetary space. So how do we move forward? It's really become a big challenge. But further more than that, when we say the real economy is, is awake, the financial sector grows strongly, you will see the financial in the advanced economy today, total assets is much bigger than the financial assets we had in 2007, roughly from a 192 trillion to 215 trillion, increased 15%. Emerging market increased 30% as well. So financial sector grow very strongly. And while financial sector grow very strong, you will see the the sovereign bonds yield on downsides because ample liquidity and uh, the global uh, uh, the volatility in index drop. That means in financial sector, the investor take more risk, risk appetite increase dramatically. Let me go back to this way. And also more than that, the shadow banking increase quite a bit. This is 2007, you will see in the UK, that today's shadow bank is account roughly 300% of GDP now. In the US, shadow bank is also bad. And the record of 2008, the shadow banking is the main cause of the financial crisis. And today, we clearly see the financial risk is accumulating in financial sector as well. And, uh, in sh but in shadow banking, the real change in internal structure is, is moving from the money market fund to the assets management, management company. Assets management companies really increased dramatically. And also, the concentration is very high. Five major assets management companies account for roughly 30% of global servant bonds issues as well, which have a concentration risk. But when central banks have and provide a lot of liquidity to the market, we in fact see the liquidity in the market is very tight you will see the, the, the size of a trade is really drops. Its trade size becomes smaller because of liquidity issues. You will see the duration of the bonds holder become longer <coughs> because the low interest rates, everybody pick low things. The most interesting chart for this one, in the bonds market, you will see the size of the bonds need to be cleared and the dealer's inventory can clear the market have a big gap here. What we observe in financial market today is 
It's not only we see ample liquidity from the central bank, we also see a very tight liquidity because of structure issue in financial market. So we have, I call, the illusion of liquidity in the financial sector, which is quite a big risk for the today's action as well. And the meanwhile, when we say the growth is very weak, we don't have a macro policy to support the growth. The financial sector, the real sector divergence, and the real sector grows slowly. Financial sector grows strongly, accumulating further risk, and we've got to be very careful. The global structure also experiences a big change. One big change is the emerging market become bigger. You will see here, this is try to pull the table together. You will see in the GDP level, you will see in the 2008, this is the emerging market, and the emerging market today in terms of global GDP is a big than advanced economy. And in terms of consumption, emerging market is still small, but in terms of previous size, it's much bigger. In terms of trade and in terms of um, exports, and the emerging market really account for 50% of global major share now. And this is investments here yeah, on the, uh, the big share you now. So emerging market become very big. Emerging market itself is also an adjustment process. The growth is slowed down, but we see they're very much moved to low growth, but we see them are more uh, stabilized. This is the very interesting pictures. We try to capture to see what the past for the development for the emerging market. So I call this a vertical, it's a growth. It's a horizontal, I call the catch-up index, which is per capita GDP of an emerging market in terms of a per capita GDP of a United States. Because when you grow, you, you don't want to have the growth. You want to have a growth, but more important, you want to catch up. You want to, your per capita life standards and more or less pair to the advanced economy. I think that's the goal. US is very interesting. In the 60s, they start pick up, growth will become very strong, and the convergence income moving to from 15 to 20 percent. In 70s, oil shock, 80s, oil shock, they go back and forth, and the 92, 96, and the, this is Asia financial crisis, and this is a, a, a Mexico crisis, it go back and forth. So from this centuries, they really move forward now. They have a strong growth, they're also convergence. I think this is a good thing. It gives us a lot of confidence that we'll say emerging market probably have a good chance to continue to grow because their per capita GDP is still on only 27% of US level. So it's a long way to catch up. A huge space for them to grow. What does that mean? That means the global growth gravity is a really move to the emerging market. <laughs> but more than that, it's also very interesting what we observe is in the 90 to 2010 in 20 years, and roughly before crisis and right after crisis, what happened in the advanced economy, the consumption in terms of GDP increased from 75% to 80.1%. They increased 5% of consumption. Now, if you increase consumption, you all econ students, where to econ 101, what do you do? You have to reduce your investments. Indeed, the all advanced investments drop from 25% to 20%. You have to add up, right? So increase 5% consumption, you drop 5% investment. Now, which is very simple, very straightforward. The really interesting happen is other part of the war. What happened in the emerging market? In the emerging market, you see the consumption roughly from 74.2% dropped to 6.72%. Actually, they drop 7% of consumption. Meanwhile, they increase roughly 25% to 30%, 5.4% of investments. This is a fascinating. The whole world just mirror to each other. What happened before crossing, 
before 2008 financial crisis, advanced economy actually consume for the whole war. So the consume increased 5%. So they reduce investments and emerging market invest for the whole world. And they increase 6% of investment, reduce 7% of consumption. So all the number then add to together. Now the question is, is this number sustainable? The answer is probably not. Because this number is very much supported by government expenditure, by borrowing, by financial engineering, and all those activities. Now, if this number drops, we saw this number drops today a little bit already. So investments will pick up. What happened in this area? That means the consumption will pick up and investments will drop. In the past 20 years, the, big, the biggest structure shift in the whole world is advanced economy increased 5% of consumption, reduced 5% of investments, emerging market reduced 7% of investments, increased 6% of consumption. Now, they're going to <coughs> move reverse. Where will they stop? I don't know. It's not all clear. But they will cause global reshuffling, restructuring. It's very clear for me that emerging market increase consumption, reduce investments, advanced economy have to increase investments, reduce consumption. We're going to have a very interesting and a very volatile the 20 years in, in ahead of you. And the meanwhile, we experience the, the, the demographic change. You see, the labor force is really changing now, particularly in the euro area. It's dropping. Then here, I may have only a few minutes. I try to close in five minutes, and then I understand these two people are boss, <laughs> and they control the time and they control my life. On even in China, you will see. The working age population peak 2015 and on way down. We're all facing aging issues. But meanwhile, we're all facing income distribution issues. It's a big issue. What happened in the past roughly 20 years, 88 to 2008, you will see, is in the low income countries, the in income per capita increased dramatically. And, but in the advanced economy, it really, in the middle income, and particularly high end middle income income, increased very little, for example, only 10% for 20 years at the 75% uh, tail, and even negative for the people income at the 80% uh, 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 tail that level. But then, this is, a, this is the top 5% and top 10%, they have a strong income growth, obviously, this is top 0.1% that grows strongly. This is a good part. For the low income country, if the, the, the income level is so low, this is a convergence. But this is a not easy part. If you see the middle income uh, classes have a lower, even negative income growth, but 10% or 1% of people have a very strong growth. Politically, it got to be very difficult. The most uh, the challenging issue is here is the productivity growth in the past 20 years. It's about high, but it's really on downside. You will see all the countries we see here. You see the United States, the U.S., Japan, and the U.K. You will see all the productivities is really on downside. There's various reasons to explain them to them. Lower investments, lower labor participations, lower and the long-term investments, all well. But that's the key issues. Now, if we're pulling them together, we'll see the world is changing. We'll live even closer, live in a such interconnected world. And the growth is weak because we don't have investments. We don't have a trade. We don't have a FDI. It really symbolizes changing globalization on the and we don't have an aggregate demand side policy. We don't have a fiscal policy space. We don't have a monetary policy space. And the divergence between the real economy and the financial sector become a real concern now. 
But meanwhile, global experience another fundamental structure change, and the, and the shifting between the advanced economy and the emerging market, and we all suffering experience the three fundamental change in income inequality change, productivity change, and also the demographic change as well. <coughs> The first issue is this new war, the war that we never observed before. The second point is this is a very, very challenging war. So since we don't have a demand side policy, I think the policy will have to move to supply side. That means the first issue is we need to do structural reform. We need to do the product market and competition improves. We need to do the labor market uh, reform to improve labor market flexibilities. We need to increase service sector productivity, which is a key issue for almost all countries, particularly in the advanced economy, and the pension reform as well. But we need more smart investments. It's not only invest in the infrastructure area, but also into the Nordic economy, in the long-term R&D, innovation of SME, and also uh, we need a measure to move tradable sector to their frontiers, and we need to invest in the long-term human capital as well. So I think the smart investment become more important, and we need a supply-side policy to supporting the monetary and fiscal policy to support, use the aggregate demand-side policy to support the, the, the supply-side policy as well. So it's not driven by demand-side, uh, a razor is sh driven by supply side, but use the demand side policy to support on the, uh, the supply side policy well. Now it's easy to say, right? Well, we talk about structural reform for decades. Every politician talk about they're going to structural reform, but really, are they delivered? Maybe, not very much. Why is that? Because at the macro level, it's always relatively easy to use the aggregate demand side policy. Politically, it's a much more challenging to use the supply side policy to do the structural form. Because you're changing people's things. But it seemed to me it's a must. So the world facing the challenger, we need the supply side policies, we need the new leaders to form, have a view of the whole world, understand the changing of the world, and forming and support the supply side of structural reform, then push the potential growth, so we will be able to move the whole world forward. That's your job. You're the new generation. They are the future leaders. I think understand the world of the day, to understand the changing path and the new path of the world of today, and understand the angle to look into the global economic situations, and to put yourself, participate yourself into this surprise side of policy movement. I think that's the way we'll be able to move the whole world forward. That's the message. There's a story I want to bring to you today. Thank you very much. <laughs>